nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. Welcome everyone to uh, Hands Online Lab Education with Remote SEM. Today's feature speakers will be uh, Zachary Gray and we have Rain uh, Network Partners. We'll explain what that is later on as we get uh, further into the into the today's webinar. Um, a co-host today will be um, myself. My name is Bob Ehrman and um, Dr. Oscar uh, Chakmuk from uh, here. At, we're both here at uh, residing here at Penn State University. So thank you again for coming to our webinar today. Um, so the webinar today is hosted by uh, the NAC uh, National Resource Center. We're in National Science Foundation Advanced Technological Education Resource Center. Um, so we're, we thank the, uh, the NSF ATE uh, for enabling us to uh, be able to provide this webinar for you. Uh, and we also are here at Penn State University. We're in the Center for Nanotechnology Education and Utilization, which is in the Penn State College of Engineering's Department of Engineering, Science, and Mechanics. Uh, the agenda for today's uh, webinar uh, we're going to follow is right here. Um, this is the introduction period, obviously. Uh, we're going to, uh, Dr. Gray is going to be talking about micros microscopy in the classroom. He's then going to do a live demonstration of uh, the Nanoscience Instruments Phenom Desktop SE SEM. Uh, we're then going to go to our panel and talk about some educator experiences using remote access and how you as the uh, people who are attending today can get involved. Some of you may have already. And then we'll do a quick summary. Um, as I mentioned, this is uh, our uh, co-host, uh, myself and uh, Dr. Chuck Muck, uh, and Dr. Gray will be the uh, presenter today. Uh, he's an application scientist at uh, Nanoscience Instruments, and he's headquartered in, uh, well, he's in the Phoenix area, but I'm not sure exactly what town he's in. I want to say, I don't know. He'll have to say that when he gets up here. So, um, uh, Oscar, you want to say hi real quick? Hi, everybody. Hi, am Oscar. And this is a teaching professor at Penn State, and I'm in the field as a both educator and researcher in the field of nanotechnology and nanocharacterization. Back to you, Bob. Thank you very much. Our panelists, uh, since we have four of them, I'm just going to introduce them very quickly here, and then we'll bring them back on, um, and they'll introduce themselves later when we do get to our panel. Um, uh, we got Dr. Ray Chui at uh, Arizona State uh, University. Uh, we got Maud. Cuchera at uh, Cuchera at North Carolina State University. Uh, we got Rich Hill at SUNY Erie uh, Community College, and we got Eve Terrio at um, the San Diego Nanotechnology Institute, which is at the University of California, San Diego. So we got people scattered all across the country. And now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Gray, and we'll let uh, we'll give uh, Zach the central stage. Thanks, Zach. Awesome. Thank you very much, Bob. So, yeah, just to briefly introduce myself, uh, my name is Zach Gray. Actually, uh, Bob and Uzger and I, we actually all go way back. So, uh, this isn't like I'm just meeting these guys for this webinar. I've worked uh, with Bob on and off for the last decade on a, a variety of things. So, it's uh, quite an honor to get to work with uh, Penn State again. I used to work for Penn State for a number of years as well. And then I, uh, once I finished school, I moved across the country here to nanoscience um, in Phoenix. So Bob was right, it's in Phoenix. And um, yeah, it's uh, gonna be quite, quite a fun uh, little experience here. So I wanna talk to everyone today about the uh, remote access of the scanning electron microscope along with uh, just the scanning electron microscope in general as a technique and why it's important, I think, for students uh, to get this as uh, an experience and a skill set. So to begin, a uh, real quick slide about the company. So Nanoscience Analytical and Penn State University are co-hosting this webinar. So uh, Bob will talk a little bit more about that, the RAIN network uh, later in the presentation. Just a quick slide on Nanoscience. For those of you who haven't heard of Nanoscience Instruments, it's a small company. Uh, we're headquartered in Phoenix, Arizona. We have a team of scientists and engineers with a variety of different backgrounds. 
And essentially what the company does is uh, we are a value added distributor. So we provide training, support, uh, service, applications development, so on and so forth for, for customers. So nanoscience distributes instruments for larger uh, scientific instrumentation companies. Uh, the, the, the one that many of you probably have heard of is Thermo Fisher. So we distribute uh, one of Thermo Fisher's or several of Thermo Fisher's desktop scanning electron microscopes. And I'm going to show you one of those microscopes today in real time. In addition to being a value-added distributor, we also have an analytical services department, which is kind of cool. So what the analytical services division does is for people who need data, but maybe don't have the capital funding to buy a piece of equipment to get the data, you can send us your sample and then, you know, our analytical services will get you the data that you need without you actually needing to buy the instrument. You just buy the data, basically. So um, the company has grown fairly rapidly over the last uh, 10 years. And uh, it's been an exciting uh, journey for me working with, with this company for the last uh, four plus years as well. So now let's dive into the presentation. Uh, the first thing we're going to talk about today is microscopy in the classroom, kind of as we know it. And then I'm going to actually show you uh, scanning electron microscope live. And not only am I going to show it to you live, I'm actually going to remotely control it from my laptop uh, just to kind of show you how easy it is to remotely control this instrumentation. And then following the live demo, I believe we're going to have a brief Q&A break. So if you guys have any questions, uh, Bob and Ushger will, will address them uh, during that little break there. And then we're going to segue over to our panelists who can talk about their firsthand experience with remote access. And then we'll wrap it all up. So microscopes of all types. Uh, have made their way into educational environments. This is nothing new, right? So here you can just see uh, compound light microscopes on every desk in a, in a science lab. And these microscopes are the most common microscopes used today. And there's a lot of reasons why. So they're simple, they're, they're low cost, they're readily available, and they're, they're small, right? You can fit one on every desk. So this is kind of the reason why, one of the reasons why this, this type of microscope has become so ubiquitous in the classroom. However, um, there's a lot of other types of microscopes out there, and many of them could benefit the student as well. We're going to talk about one of those today, that being the scanning electron microscope. Now, a lot of these reasons that compound light microscopes are so common if you were to uh, use a microscope remotely, you wouldn't have to necessarily worry about some of, the, some of these things, right? Like small footprints, no longer a big deal if you're using the instrument remotely. The microscope could take up an entire room. Who cares if you're using it from home? Uh, low cost as well. They're low cost because you need 20 of them. If you only need one of them and 20 different students can use it remotely, it doesn't necessarily need to be as low of a cost. Simplicity is obviously important uh, regardless of whether you're using it uh, hands-on or remotely. And as I'll show you today, uh, the scanning electron microscope that we have here is very, very simple to use. So a quick slide on the traditional light microscope. This is actually an ancient photo that I took when I worked at Penn State of one of the uh, light microscopes in the clean room at Penn State that I TA'd students on back there. Uh, so this is just your traditional uh, light optical microscope. And it just uses photons to get an image. And because we're using photons, we're getting true color images. One of the major limitations of the optical microscope is uh, max mag. So it's only typically on the order of a 100x objective. And as we'll see shortly, that's going to limit your applications. And the other thing with light microscopes is they have a limited depth of focus, and that's going to cause lots of blurry areas in your image if the sample has lots of different heights within your field of view. There are ways around this. Optically, you can use an optical profiler and do a scan, uh, but then, of course, that's going to take longer and it's going to be a more sophisticated piece of equipment. So the reason that the optical microscope is limited is primarily because it's optical and it's using photons. So the microscope maker's rule, many of you may have seen this before or heard of this before, is you can't look at things smaller than what you're trying to look at them with. So because photons have that wavelength of 400 to 700 nanometers, and you can play a few tricks, and you can get the resolution of the optical microscope down to about 0 0.2 microns, but it's going to be really hard to do much better than that. So that's 200 nanometers, right? Whereas with an SEM, we're not using photons at all anymore. Now we're actually using a, an electron beam that's rastering back and forth over the surface to get our image. And the electron's wavelength is dependent on its energy. 
So we're no longer limited by that 400 to 700 nanometers. And as a result, uh, we can get higher resolution images with SCM. And then just the final example of the microscope maker's rule would be tools like an AFM or a stylus profilometer. Now your resolution is actually limited by the end apex radius of your probe. So, you know, those are some different examples of how the microscope maker's rule applies. And if we highlight here, 400, 700 nanometers, that's where we're going to be in that IR range. And the nanotechnology window, nanotechnology in the definition is the size and manipulation of, of features and objects in this one to 100 nanometer range. So optically, we're not going to be able to get there, but we can get, we can use optical as kind of a middleman to find the rough area we need to be. And then we can go to a technique such as SEM and we can get down into that 10 to 100 nanometer range. Uh, or one to 100 nanometer range by utilizing electrons instead of photons. So the scanning electron microscope is, as I mentioned, it's now using an electron beam that's rastering across the surface. And the interactions of that electron beam with the surface are generating various signals. And depending on what type of signal we pick up, we can get different information. So if we detect the electrons that are backscattered from the surface, we're getting a backscattered electron image or just uh, basically an SEM image. Alternatively, x-rays are also coming off the sample. And if we detect the x-rays, now we're actually getting elemental information. I'm going to show you both of these in real time um, shortly. It's very easy to do this. It may sound complex, but it's actually very, very simple. Uh, we get grayscale images with large fields of view and best-in-class depth of field. Uh, this is one of the biggest benefits of the scanning electron microscope as a technology is anyone that's ever seen an SEM image knows it almost appears 3D because the depth of field is so large. We also get a much higher magnification on an SEM. So tabletop SEM and tabletop SEM basically means it sits on the top of a table uh, as opposed to a floor model, which is a, a larger SEM that you know might take up half a room. So tabletop SEMs, which is what I'm gonna show you today, they're, they're much smaller. Uh, this one here actually just kind of looks like a big computer tower. Uh, but these guys can still go quite high in magnification. So the one I'm going to show you today can go up to uh, uh, close to 300,000 X. And elemental identification is also available. So elemental identification basically means you park the electron beam at a spot on your sample that you're looking at in the microscope, and it'll say, hey, this is 48% silicon and 52% nitrogen. So it'll actually break down the chemistry of your material and give you that data, which is really, really nice. So what I want to do is I've kind of briefly mentioned two different types of microscopes, and these are indeed two of the most commonly used microscopes in the field today, whether it be in academia or in industry. These are probably the two most popular types of microscopes used uh, because they are relatively simple and they complement each other very well. So I'm going to show you guys a series of images that were obtained with the two different types of microscopes. Optical will be on the left and scanning electron will be on the right. And the purpose of this is to allow you guys to kind of really appreciate um, how these microscopes differ and why an SDM is valuable relative to the, the traditional optical microscope. Um, this may already be obvious, but all of these images I'm going to show you were taken at the exact same spot on the exact same sample. So this is a true apples to apples comparison uh, of how the techniques differ. So the first image here is actually of a silicon nitride uh, solar panel. So anyone that's driven down a highway and looked up and seen a solar panel, you probably have realized they're blue in color. And not surprisingly, you can see that optical microscope image is indeed blue, which is really nice. That's one of the strong points of an optical microscope is that it gives you the true color of your sample, whereas the FCM is not true color. It's actually a range of grayscale values. However, a, you'll also notice the FCM image looks a little crisper, a little sharper, and equally important, you'll notice you know, a little bit of blurriness on the optical image, but it's not so bad. But what's interesting about the FCM image is if you know how to interpret the image uh, fully, you can actually get additional information that's not present on the optical image. So in FCM, we have something called Z contrast when we use our backscattered electron detector. Z contrast means brighter areas in your image correspond to higher atomic number materials. So when you look at that image on the right, you see those little white areas or those bright spots. We know, we may not know what they are, but we know those bright spots have a higher atomic number than silicon nitride, which is the blue material, right? Silicon has an atomic number of 14 on the periodic table. Whatever those bright spots are, it's a higher Z number than 14. So it's probably some type of metal. 
But you can't make that same conclusion when you look at the optical image. Those bright spots, I mean, it could be metal or it could just be little chips of white paint. We don't know what it is. But on the SEM image, we can immediately say, hey, this is some type of metallic material on the surface. And then we can do EDS to further quantify that. And we could actually go the other way as well. So if you look closely at that SEM image towards the top right, you can see some darker areas, little uh, darker gray shades. What this indicates is that there's a material on the surface that's a lower atomic number uh, because it's a lower atomic number than silicon. So if you think of the periodic table, you think of things like carbon, six, oxygen, eight, nitrogen, seven, organics, right? So the SEM image gives us that type of information as well. And if you try to find that same information looking at the optical image, you don't see that at all. There's no evidence that there's smudge there or dirt on the surface, whereas in the SEM, we immediately get that. And then we can take all this to the next level, as I'll show you later. We can do EDS, and we can actually confirm these materials are what we think they are based on the Z contrast. So another comparison, uh, I, I mentioned earlier the best in class depth of field of, of the scanning electron microscope technology. And this is a, a nice illustration. So this is a, a small particle sitting inside of an iron mesh. And if you look at the optical image, it, it looks really blurry almost everywhere, except I did my best to try to focus on the top of that ball. But you see by doing that, we're really limiting our, our focus plane. So right here, you can see where my, my mouse is. That's where we're focused, but everything up here is blurry. So we don't have any useful information. Now, if you look at the FEM image, you can see everything is simultaneously in focus. And again, this is the same exact sample, um, same exact location on that sample. And you can see in SEM, you can see these little, these little smudge marks. And we now know that this is some type of organic because it's darker than the matrix, like we talked about in the last slide. And again, when you look at the optical, you're losing all of that information because you're not focused at the right spot. So what does this ultimately mean? The increased depth of field in SEM enables rapid inspection over large areas quickly because you don't need to continuously refocus and, and find a, re a new position. You can simply use the SEM as a defect inspection instrument without having to change your settings constantly. Whereas optically, you would need to change your microscope, your course focus knobs to move to the new focal point. And uh, I've been to lots of labs that have SEMs and they're using it just to quickly pop a sample in, drive around all over the sample and look for things like these, these black dots here because they can do it super quickly because everything is in focus uh, simultaneously for, for a lot of different samples that you'll look at on this technique. Final uh, comparison slide is uh, these are some tin balls. So you saw it on the last slide, and this one's even worse. Uh, the limited depth of focus of optical, right? This, these, these, uh, I'm trying my best to get a focused image here, but you only have a small slice of Z that you can focus on. And here you can see, you know, I'm getting some of the smaller ones, but the, the bigger ones are, are blurry because they're out of the focal plane. SEM offers substantially higher resolution, which is what this slide is actually trying to uh, show. So if you look at this uh, box here, this green box towards the right-hand side of the image, I've shown that there are some fairly small particles that we're detecting with the SEM, and the optical is hanging in there. You can still see some of those particles optically uh, within this green box, but it gives up at a certain point. So if you now look at this red box, you can see within this box, you can see in the FCM, you can see these tiny little particles. And in that same location on the optical image, they just appear to have vanished because the optical just gives up at a certain point. And I should mention, this is the max magnification of the optical microscope here that I'm showing you. So this is a 100x objective image, which is the standard max objective for optical microscopes. Um, whereas with the FCM, we're just kind of scratching the surface. I could zoom in to this red box, um, you know, very, very easily and quickly, and we could zoom in even more if we would like. Um, what I found by bringing the SCM out in the field and demoing it to uh, prospects and training customers is a very large percentage of the work in SCM, especially in tabletop SCM, uh, over 90% of the work that we're doing is in this 1,000X to 20,000X range. So in that range, um, we've noticed lots of different companies looking for things at that size scale. So we're not, you know, we're not 150,000 X. We're not looking at, you know, like, you know, four nanometer particles or anything crazy like that. But we're in this, this submicron to micron range. Lots of valuable information is found in this range. And these companies that I'm going and demoing the phenom to, 
these are companies everybody on here has heard of. These are huge companies. It's not like, you know, some only specialized little tiny companies are using this technology. Lots of companies are using this. And this is the big, the big idea here is, this is all about the students getting a valuable skill set. And if a student is able to put SEM as a bullet point on the resume, if they say, hey, I have experience using an SEM, whatever, whatever SEM it may be, uh, that's extremely helpful for them in, in getting employment after they finish going to college. Um, and, and I speak from, from firsthand experience. I went through Penn State's uh, nanoscience uh, NMC program um, Close to 15 years ago, I went through that program and I got to put SEM as a bullet point on my resume saying, hey, I know how to use an SEM. And, you know, within six months of finishing their nanotechnology program, I got a job at a small company using SEM as part of my job as a process technician. So it, it really is uh, valuable, I think, for, for our students to be able to say they have SEM experience. Uh, more so than most techniques. There's, as you guys know, in nanotechnology education, especially, there's dozens and dozens of different uh, pieces of equipment we teach our students. But I would, I would honestly rank SEM at the very top of that list, along with optical. It's, it's very important as well for for students to have as skill sets for their resume. Final comparison: um, A lot of people may hear, "Oh, scanning electron microscope," and they hear, "Oh, electron," and they think it's complicated. Uh, it's, it's not. So the scanning electron microscope is very easy to use. Uh, the, the, the one I'm going to show you today in particular is extremely easy to use. Uh, so on the right there is actually a picture of, of myself with some, some fourth graders. And I took the phenom over to Mesa. So I'm here in Phoenix and Mesa is about a 25 minute drive away. So I loaded the phenom into a back of a, a van and I drove it over there and I set it up at the local elementary school. And I had uh, fourth graders using the phenom within, you know, 10, 15 minutes of arriving and having fun with it. So it's, it's not like you need a specialized degree or skill set or previous experience to operate this instrument. Uh, it's very, very user friendly, as are obviously the optical microscopes as well. So finally, uh, summary side between these two techniques, um, I'm going to focus on that table over there to the right. So the, the big thing is the imaging source is different, right? Optical uses photons and the scanning electron microscope uses electrons. But that one difference creates huge difference. So most, most notably, the, um, the, the one big difference is the, um, the essentially the detectors. So an optical is using an eyepiece where, or your eye, and the FDM is now using like a backscattered electron detector or something like that. And on the, uh, on the other hand, uh, both, they have some similarities as well. So they're both very easy to use and they don't require a dedicated operator. So if you have an SEM in your lab, you don't need to hire a special person to work on it. Uh, you, you know, the person in purchasing that bought the SEM could use it. It's, it's really quite easy. And then the other thing is the SEM provides elemental contrast, whereas optical does not. And this is important because it lends to a lot of different lab content you can create for your students. There's a lot of really rich chemistry and physics behind how all of this works, uh, which is something you could create labs around for, it doesn't have to be a nanotech lab, it could be a physics lab or a chemistry lab uh, that you can get some cool stuff out of using SEM. So what has enabled SEM to be more ideally equipped for remote access? So in order to have a, a piece of instrumentation that you can use for remote access, it needs certain uh, qualities. So things that you would like to see for, uh, you know, remote access would be no hardware controls. So that kind of makes sense, right? If, if your instrument has like knobs that you need to turn to move your sample, or if your instrument has a joystick that you need to move around, then obviously that's not very well suited for remote access because you can't, if you're not at the instrument, you can't turn the knobs on it, right? So that's one thing that you kind of need for ideal remote access. You would like to have a simplified software user interface. That's pretty obvious. Automatic functions. This is actually really important and often overlooked. So when you're doing remote access, uh, you're going to have naturally, there's going to be some, some degree of lag, right? You may be running an instrument from across the country, and you're going to notice that even a little bit today when I show you the live demo, you may notice a little bit of lag because we're broadcasting you know, over across the country or whatever it may be. But if you have an auto function, that's going to greatly enhance the experience. So 
imagine you're on a blurry surface and you're, you're turning your mouse wheel to try to focus it, but you're also fighting lag and you find the focal plane, but because of lag, you go past it and that could be kind of frustrating. But if you have an autofocus function or an auto brightness function, you just click a button and the software will do its thing for a second or two. And then it's going to give you your sharp image without having that frustration of dealing with the lag. And the improved autofocus algorithm on the Phenom in particular has really, really enhanced its ability to be used remotely. And I'm going to show you guys that today as well. Uh, you want a single software package. So with SEM, I had mentioned where we not only does it get high magnification images, but we can get elemental composition information. With most uh, microscopes, most scanning watcher microscopes, those are done by different vendors. Uh, so you would have to be dealing with perhaps two monitors or perhaps file conversions or minimizing and maximizing windows. It would be really nice if you could have everything on one monitor and be able to do everything within one field of view and not have to know what to minimize and reopen different softwares. And that's also been incorporated into the new user interface of the Phenom that I'm going to show you today. And then, of course, easy data exporting and sharing. So those are the things we want. And the Phenom, uh, the new UI, has incorporated uh, all of those things. And that's what the live demonstration will, will hopefully prove to you guys. Uh, these things are, are now implemented and really well suited for remote access. Some additional attributes uh, of the Phenom Desktop XL SEM for remote access include a large sample stage. So you can load up to 36 samples at once into the system. So here's what the sample stage looks like. It's four inches in X by four inches in Y, and we can go down, um, you know, well over an inch. I believe it's about 35 millimeters uh, in Z we have to work with. But what's important is, if you think about it, you can load up to 36 samples. So the lab, the lab the person in the lab or the PA, they could get samples from 36 different students, and each student could prepare their own sample or whatever and then send them all in. And then you would just need to go in one time, load their 36 samples in there, and then you could actually do remote access and allow 36 different students to run the system without even needing to go back in and exchange a sample. So that's really nice. Uh, we also have high throughput. Uh, so if you did need to take the sample out and put it back in, uh, it's going to take less than a minute or two. It's not like there's a long pump down that you need to wait for. Uh, the system was also user friendly and user proof. So as I showed you, you know, fourth graders could use it. I, I keep picking on fourth graders. Let's, let's, uh, let's say fifth graders could use it or third graders could use it. Uh, and it's also really, really easy, and it's user-proof. This is probably even more important. So user-proof, what, what this means is it's impossible to break the system by clicking the wrong button. And if you're using the instrument remotely, and your only option is click buttons because you're using it remotely, you can't break it. Uh, so you could, you could you know, set it up with, with your student, with your fifth grader, and turn them loose and let them click any button they want, and they're actually not going to be able to damage anything um, remotely, which is really, really nice. Uh, ultra bright source. So the uh, Phenom desktop SEM uses a cerium hexaboride source, uh, kind of like a next generation lab six for, for those of you who have done SEM before. Uh, so this is a lot different than the conventional tungsten source. Uh, so here's a kind of an image of the sources of what they look like. So the tungsten source is the classic source used in SEM. And if you just look at that picture, it's a lot uh, thinner. And as a result, the source is a lot more susceptible to minor changes in the environment. And the result to the operator is they have to do something called stigmation a lot more with a tungsten source than a cerium hexaboride source. Uh, you very rarely, maybe once or twice a year, need to do stigmation. And ideal, you can see how that is very good for remote access. If you're trying to use an SEM remotely, and you have to now not only fight the focus knob, but also fight the stig X and the stig Y, it's going to make it fairly difficult. Whereas on the phenom, because we're using cerium hexaboride, the student or operator only needs to worry about the one knob as opposed to multiple knobs. And it also provides, and as a result of that, it provides very nice image quality, even for novice users. A fourth grader who's never used an SCM in their life could walk up to the system, and if you spent a few minutes telling them what the buttons do, they could get a crystal clear image. Uh, and then a simplified software interface I won't ramble about that too much because I'm going to show it here uh, in, a, in a second. So here is just kind of a quick comparison of that UI. So many of you may have actually seen a Phenom desktop SEM before. Uh, that's the classic user interface on the left that you've probably seen if you've seen one. Um, it is uh, That was developed back in 2006, and 
Uh, so there's over 3,000 of these systems throughout the world. So this isn't like some tiny little SEM company that just came out. This is it's actually the world's best-selling SEM. And um, what they've done, though, in 2020 is they've redesigned the entire new UI. And that's one of the reasons we're doing this webinar today is the new UI was, was, was designed uh, with a lot of things in mind, one of them being more well-equipped for remote learning. And you can see here that the new UI on the right and basically what we've done is it's now a 24 inch monitor as opposed to the smaller monitor there. So the image, the field of view is, is a lot larger. And the other big difference is the EDS is now incorporated. I mentioned earlier, you would like to have everything in one field of view. And you can see on the right hand side there is our EDS. Uh, EDS is basically our elemental analysis, which I'll show you here in a second. So at this point, I'm going to uh, show you guys in real time what this microscope looks like, how I can use it. I'm going to control it from the same laptop I'm projecting this PowerPoint from. And then after that, I'm going to, uh, we're going to turn it over to uh, Bob and Oscar for a questions break. And then we're going to go to our panelists and they're going to talk uh, very, very uh, practically about what they're doing with remote education. All right. So, we're going to do a, a live demonstration now of the system. So what I'm going to do, uh, hopefully you guys can all still see my screen. I'm going to go to a uh, media player here and hopefully you can see a, a video view. This is a live video view of the phenom. And I'm actually sitting at my laptop right now. So you don't see, you know, if I was controlling the phenom, I would obviously be using, you know, this mouse right here, but I'm going to open that door of the phenom from my laptop. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you guys how we load the sample. So I'm going to go ahead here. I'm going to open that door. So the door should be opening. All right, come back here. So the door is open. And I'm going to show you guys how simple it is to load a sample. So here is our, this is the sample holder. And just, just note, um, I'm broadcasting this through Team Viewer. And we are already on a Zoom call. So there's going to be uh, potentially a little bit of lag. Um, but if there is some lag, just be aware um, if that may be the reason. All right, so here's the sample holder. Uh, it's four inches by four inches. And then again, I said it goes about 35 millimeters deep. And I have a sample already loaded in here. So we mount the samples on the uh, SVM pin subs. And you can put anything you want on here. You can put a hair, you can put an ant, so on and so forth. And I turn this knob. And when I turn this knob, the whole tray is lowering. And then once I've lowered the sample, it's not super important how much I lower it. Uh, once I lower the sample, I take this and I just take this entire tray and I pop it in the system. So can't get much easier than that. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to close the door. So again, I'm going to uh, open up. I'm, I'm running through TeamViewer here on my laptop. So I'm going to open up TeamViewer. I'm going to close that door, come back to the video view. And at this point, the sample is loaded. And then what you're going to see is an optical image pops up on the screen of our sample that I just loaded. So now I'm going to just go over here. I'm going to show you the team viewer view. So now you should be able to just see um, the UI that I'm seeing. And I'm going to go ahead and go into uh, the SDM mode. I can click this button to go into SDM mode. There's some other buttons on here. Um, like there's a mag button, there's a brightness and contrast button, there's a focus button. Anyone that's seen the Phenom, the old Phenom UI, these buttons are all very similar to what they used to be. But what's new is we have these buttons over here on the right that do our EDS. So we talked about optical microscopy a little bit during the demo, and the, the Phenom has a built-in uh, optical microscope. So we can still do some basic light microscopy inside of the Phenom, uh, but then, of course, we can go into SDM as well. So that solar cell that I was showing you earlier, this might actually be a good one to, to show you. So if you guys recall that blue solar cell we looked at earlier, here, here it is on my, uh, my stub. So I can actually, I'm going to go ahead and tell the system to move into SDM mode. And it's going to, so you see how long it takes. It takes a little less than 40 seconds uh, to get into SDM. So that's uh, really, for anyone who's done SDM before, that's, uh, that's fast. And the reason it's so fast is because it, it is a relatively small volume we're pumping out, and the system is differentially pumped as well, which helps with that pump down time. So once I get into SEM, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to 
make a couple of moves, show you how, how easy it is to move around. So you can use the arrow keys on your keyboard, or I can just click with the mouse. So you see when I get in there, it automatically, it'll help us do an autofocus. And then I'm clicking on the screen. And as I click, whatever location I click is where it's going to center our field of view. So, okay. You should be able to see me moving around here. And I'm zooming in. So I click on this microscope button here, and then that's going to allow me to zoom in. So pretty straightforward. Yeah, and again, if there is any lag, I apologize. I know, um, like I said, I'm, I'm trying to show you this remotely through TeamViewer, but um, my, my goal is that you guys can see the, the ease of use of the system. Um, so. Well, essentially, we have three knobs down here. We have our magnifications. If I turn my mouse wheel, I execute the magnification. I have brightness and contrast. And then I have, as well, I have this focus button. And the little letter A on the button stands for auto. And you can turn that on and off. So if you would prefer students get the experience of focusing manually, you could certainly do that. I could right click this and I could say, okay, let's go to manual contrast or let's go to you know, autofocus, or I could say I'd rather go to manual focus, or I want the breakout box that many of you have seen in FCM before. Those options are all there as well. Um, and then I'm going to show you the EDS real quick. Obviously, if you wanted to save a picture, you just click the camera button, and it'll save the, the, the picture. So for EDS, if I click this, uh, this little spectrum button right here, uh, that's actually going to allow us to do EDS. So wait for it to respond. We have our EDS now, and then I can click this little plus sign, and then it's going to pull our image over, and then I'll show you what an EDS map looks like. So I draw a box anywhere I want within the image, and it's going to spatially resolve the different materials present in our field of view. And this is what we were talking about earlier. The SCM actually has the ability to color code the sample, and I'm looking at it. Uh, on a laptop here, and it's not it's not caught up yet. I'm looking at it on the phenom, and it's already almost there. It goes, it just caught up. Um, so you can see here, we have silicon, we have silver, we have carbon. This is what EDS mapping does. Each pixel in the image, the brighter the color of the pixel, the higher the concentration of the material at that pixel. So that's EDS mapping. Uh, really, really uh, useful, really cool. And then I can control A and I can overlay this so you have everything at once. You can change the colors of these things, so on and so forth. Um, so that's, in, in a nutshell, that's, that's the phenom. And then if I wanted to go back to the image view, it says, hey, this is locked because you're doing elemental analysis. And then I could say, okay, I, I get the idea. I have enough. And then I can stop it. I could go back to the live microscope view. I could move to another sample. Um, that's the final thing I want to show you on here, and then I'm going to turn it over to uh, Bob for Q&A, is I want to very briefly show you um, our uh, nav cam so you can see the, the lag, um, definitely a little laggy. Uh, this, this is waiting for this to minimize, um, but once this minimizes, you should see here in a second uh, what it looks like for our optical view. You know? Oh. Hasn't had his coffee yet. So, oh, uh, yeah, it's the Wi Fi. <laughs> okay, no, no worries. I'm just going to go back to the presentation here. Right. All right, I'm just going to go from here. I'm going to talk about the um, uh, who the panelists are. Uh, there are members of the RAIN network, and the panelists, if they could come on, uh, put their pictures up. I'm going to stop sharing in a second. They're members of the RAIN network, um, uh, which actually has sites from coast to coast, from the west coast to the east coast. Uh, in this example here, we have people from uh, Arizona, from San Diego, from upstate New York, and from North Carolina uh, representing our RAIN network providers. Um, and you can actually do remote access from your classrooms wherever you are um, just by going to our website, which you see here is uh, www.nano4me dot orgs backslash remote access uh, and you can all uh, do that at any time uh, there's an easy fill out the uh, request form and uh, uh, say what you what instrument you want to look at it's not just SEM there we have 48 different instruments available uh, both fabrication and uh, and characterization equipment uh, by far the 
the one that is the most utilized is the SEM. It's it's a very a str very high percentage of our um, of our usage. Um, so I just wanted to put that in there, and I'm going to uh, now actually talk to our um, panelists here and let them uh, spend a couple minutes about their experiences util utilizing um, electron or, or remote access, um, either remote ac either SEM or other instruments. Um, and our panelists are uh, Eve. Yves Terrio from uh, UCSD, as I mentioned earlier, Rich Hill from uh, upstate New York, SUNY Erie, um, which is in Williamsville, New York, uh, Mochichara at uh, North Carolina State U University or the RTNN, uh, and uh, Ray Chewy at uh, ASU. And I'm going to start with Ray. Uh, Ray, why don't you tell us a little bit about your experiences utilizing, um, uh, utilizing remote access, if you will. Thank you, Bob. Um, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Ray Choi, and I am with Arizona State University uh, in an organization called the Nanotechnology Collaborative Infrastructure Southwest. Now, that's a, that's a mouthful, so we usually just go by NCI Southwest. And uh, this organization is one of 16 sites of the National Nanotechnology Coordinated Infrastructure. That's another mouthful. But basically, it's a network that supports both the research and development of uh, nanoscale science and technology, as well as um, workforce development um, for, for this particular field. And um, two of my fellow panelists are from um, other sites within this national network. And um, later on, you will hear about um, their programs. But as far as the NCI Southwest is concerned, um, we have been uh, part of their uh, RAIN network for, oh, I think, uh, four or five years now. And uh, we've been doing uh, remote access to our SEM during that, that time. We used a desktop SEM uh, primarily for education and outreach, though we do use it a little bit once in a while uh, for research also. And uh, by the way, um, our SEM is an earlier version of the Phenom um, SEM that Dr. Gray has been telling you about just now. And um, so it has some, some of the features that you, you, you have seen. Now in, the, um, in, in our remote sessions, we uh, just use a Zoom link. So it's, it's uh, basically you don't need um, any kind of specialized uh, a so software. And in the case of education, we have used our SEM uh, remotely for, for doing labs for both community college classes as well as university classes. For outreach, we have conducted sessions with a lot of schools ranging from fourth, fifth grade, all the way up through um, two-year community colleges. Uh, we've also done a lot of uh, outreach to the general public. Um, every year, Arizona State University has an open house and we do remote sessions there. And also annually, uh, our city has a, a STEM fair called Geeks Night Out, uh, very unusual name. And um, at those events, you really get a attendees from, um, you know, five years old, all the way up to, to grandparents. So um, we reach out very broadly to the public uh, to disseminate information about nanotechnology. Um, for outreach events, uh, our experience have told us that um, it's, it's kind of important to have the right kind of samples and make the experience relevant to the, to the um, audience. Um, for a younger audience, you know, fourth graders, for example, um, big bugs, insects of any kind are always a big hit. You know, they, the kids really love those. Um, the late middle school, early high school students are sometimes a little bit of a challenge, tougher to engage. Um, some of them uh, have been reluctantly asked by the teacher, thou shall attend this session. And at first they're not that interested. Some, some of them anyway, some are very, very engaged. Um, but sometimes the light bulb just goes on and, and all of a sudden everything 
sounds more interesting. Just an example. One time I was doing a remote SEM session with a group of, um, I think they're eight, mixture of eight and nine graders. Uh, and many of them did not seem to be very engaged. And one student suddenly asked, is that what they do in CSI, you know, the TV show? And I said, oh, exactly. Every crime lab in the world has at least one of these instruments. And then all of a sudden things clicked and, and the enthusiasm, enthusiasm level definitely picked up after that. So that was just an example of being relevant to the, to the audience. So um, in the interest of time, I'll wrap up. So uh, just want to remind everybody that providing remote access to these instruments is a great resource for a wide range of audiences. And I strongly encourage you, particularly those of you that are educators, uh, to check out by visiting the, the RAIN network website. And with that, I'll wrap up and say thank you. Thank you, Ray. Great job. Thanks for the, the summary of your, your work there. Um, I'd like to now turn it, turn the mic over to uh, Rich Hill to talk about some of the experiences that he's done his work in uh, upstate New York. And Thanks, Bob. So, yeah, I'm up here in upstate New York where it's nice and 73 degrees today, which is an unusual, but happy to have it. So what we do is um, we have an animal nanotechnology program here and I've used, I've discovered a way to use our SEM as sort of like a recruiting tool. We get high schools to come here that tour our facilities and I'll bring them down to the clean room and I'll show them from the outside through our windows what the clean room looks like and some of the tools inside of it. And then so, and I'll usually put the SEM up remotely in the classroom that I have them in and I'll talk to them and I'll put things up there. I'll zoom in, zoom out and try to get them engaged on what they see on the screen and, and you know, how close we can get and things like that. So they have try to pique their interest and maybe want to come and take our program. Uh, I've been working with the rain for like about seven years now doing sessions. Um, we also use our, our tools sometimes to help out at webinars. Uh, sometimes I'll do a, an SEM session with a group of people for, on a webinar. We'll do some breakout sessions and we'll, you know, show them how it works and give them a chance to even try it. And that's pretty much how it goes over here at our end right now. So I'll go ahead and hand that off to someone else. Thank you very much. You guys have been a great partner, a RAIN partner, and uh, very active and uh, always willing to do uh, RAIN sessions for us. So we really appreciate it. Uh, now I'm going to uh, ask uh, Eve the same question uh, about his work in uh, at UCSD and his work in Southern California. Sure, thank you. So uh, I'm Eve Terrio, and uh, I am from the San Diego Nanotechnology Infrastructure, which is a part of uh, UC San Diego. Um, and uh, one thing I have to say is that we uh, we reach you know about three thousand students so far, and uh, one thing is uh, that. 100% uh, we get fascination from all the students. There's never, you know, a student in the back of the class, you know, that looks like bored. Uh, it, is, uh, it is really, uh, you know, opening, I believe, you know, brain zones. Uh, when you can see matter at the nano scale, micro scale, uh, you know, it, it really uh, expand, uh, you know, your, your mental ability, I believe. Um, the other thing that is nice for the kids, of course, we have, uh, provided session, elementary, middle school, high school, community colleges. The fact that they can control the SEM, of course, is very engaging, very threatening. But also what is nice in the process is that they see what is possible today, right? Being able from your own class or sometimes at home in the COVID-19 area, uh, to be able to control real time an SEM that is located at UC San Diego at the click of a mouse it's pretty fantastic. Uh, one thing I have to say, if you're a, st a STEM teacher, uh, I would strongly suggest that uh, you proceed at least to an SEM session with your students. The fact that they can see, you know, uh, structure matter at the nano scale, uh, really open, you know, as I said, brain zones, make them understand why you could apply nanotechnology to solve so many problems in so many fields of science. And, you know, eventually, you know, as their mind mature, understand the concept, for example, of convergent science. So uh, I will stop to this. I would say, you know, if you're interested in an SEM session, we're not the only providers, but we're one of them. 
and you can uh, basically use the RAIN network link and we'll be more happy to help you. Thanks, Eve. And if you act before midnight tonight, you get the Ginsu knives too, right? That's correct. <laughs> 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 okay, uh, and uh, I'm gonna. Our last panelist is uh, Maud, and Maud, if you can kind of tell All right. us what's Thanks. going on in North Carolina. Yeah, sure thing. Um, so I'll try to be brief so we can get to some questions. Um, my name is Maud again. I'm the associate director of the Research Triangle Nanotechnology Network, which is in North Carolina. It's a partnership between NC State, Duke, and UNC. Um, and so we do offer remote sessions just as um, all of us are talking about, but I wanted to plug our program and uh, let you guys know about some resources that are pre-recorded online right now. Um, so back in March when the pandemic hit and we were all staying at home, uh, we started a program called Takeout Science. And this was, um, you know, we were playing on the fact that all the restaurants were offering takeout instead of dine-in options. And so one of our staff members, Holly Letty, who I'm really going to give a shout out to now because she really spearheaded this. She brought one of our desktop SEMs. It's a Hitachi, not a Phenom. So um, sorry, Zach. <laughs> so anyways, we, she brought it home, put it in her guest bedroom, and she started broadcasting live uh, once a week sessions on YouTube with our SEM. And so we now have a library of a lot of different um, SEM sessions available on our website and uh, through our website. They're on YouTube, so they're easily accessible. The first episode has been subtitled in Spanish, if that is of interest to anyone, and we're working to, uh, to do that for more of our sessions. Um, what, each week is themed differently, and we really capitalized on some of the trends that were going on during the pandemic. So one of our episodes looked at toilet paper and other kinds of paper. Um, one of ours looked at textiles and why different types of materials may be better um, suited for making ma masks to prevent viral um, particle spread. Um, and then we even, uh, when Tiger King was uh, booming and one of those shows that everybody was watching, we reached out to one of our local organizations, Carolina Tiger Rescue, um, to get some hairs from big cats so that we could look at them. And we brought on a guest from that um, conservation organization to talk more about how to protect our wildlife. So again, um, I just want to be brief. I'll put the link to our shows on online, but if you're interested in looking at anything, we are open to, we're just continuing that program. And if you have ideas about a future show, um, it's not weekly anymore, but we're still doing it pretty um, bi-monthly. So we'd love to hear from any educators about what would be of interest to them. And all of them are live and then online afterwards. Thank you, Maud. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, so I, I'm not gonna open it up for questions. Um, there were some questions that were there. Um, uh, Dr. Chuckmuck, do you have any uh, questions you would like to ask any, either Zach or any of the panelists at this definitely, point? Definitely, definitely. So I have some questions here, especially for you, Zach, and uh, uh, the panelists also contributed to some of the answers. So I would like to emphasize their answers in the Q&A part as well. But Zach, you were, talking about the lower costs uh, and emphasizing the low cost, especially for the optical microscopes and the lower cost for the SEMs. What would you say about like, when you say lower costs for the SEMs in general, just like to give a ballpark, ballpark an idea? Yeah, sure. Um, actually, I'm an app, as an app scientist, they, they pay me to not know the price of things. They don't want me to know any of the prices. <laughs> I'm supposed to be the tr trustworthy scientist. Um, but from working with the sales guys over the last four or five years, I, I, I have the ballparks for sure. So um, you can get started, you know, well under 100K for, for a basic model, you know, just like the imaging only. Um, and then depending, so, you know, maybe, uh, you know, don't quote me on this, but, you know, 60, 70K is probably a reasonable entry point for a base system. And then, you know, depending on the bells and whistles and the stage you want, you can, you can get, you know, well over 150K. Uh, so pretty wide range, but uh, a fully loaded system, I, I don't think you're ever going to break 200K uh, on a tabletop. Whereas on a floor model, you know, you may be looking at close to a half million. So we're not we're not anywhere near there. Right. So and uh, of course, it depends on the attached detectors and the other auxiliary yep. items. Right. So yep. the one that we just remotely did, uh, that one had the EDS, the secondary electron and also mm -hmm. the backscattered one. Right. Or. 
Correct. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I didn't show you all of them um, due to time. Um, but yeah, so the one, the system in the lab um, has EDS, has SED, it has um, backscatter. So backscatter is the default detector on the phenom. That's something a lot of people don't realize is most SDMs, the default detector is the secondary detector. On the phenom, it's actually the backscatter detector. So that doesn't cost any extra. Um, so yeah, that system, you know, you'd probably be looking at uh, maybe 120, 130K uh, in that range would be my guess. Right. And I also saw that you just put it on a uh, on a desk and you didn't really need a anti vibration table, just like uh, Ray was also uh, telling in the Q&A part. But what would you say right. about the magnification? Like what when do you think it would be really problematic uh, when it comes to vibrations uh, in terms of yeah. the level? Yeah, really, um, you can do a good job. It, the system, it, generally, you don't go above. 200,000 X regardless. And, um, I would say 99% of the phenoms out there in the field do not have a special isolation table. Uh, it just doesn't require it because on this system, when, it, when things vibrate, like when the source vibrates and the table vibrates, uh, the way they're mechanically coupled, they're all in the, vibrating in the same dimension. And as a result of that, the system is very insensitive to vibration. So when you look at the price estimate, you don't need to add on the extra cost for a special table. You literally can install these about anywhere and get the same performance. Um, to give you an example, I set one up on uh, our sales guy's kitchen table, and it performed the same as the one that's set up here in the lab. Right. And people were interested in the, the compactness of your system. They were asking, like, where's the, uh, the vacuum tool? Where's the vacuum pump in there? I'll show you guys where the pump is. So it's just a small red uh, diaphragm pump. So it's a little mechanical uh, backing pump. So I'm going to go ahead and and around like what tour level does it pump it down to? What tour level? Yeah. Uh, like so that, yeah, so we're we're working at the minus um, minus seven range at the mm -hmm. source, mm -hmm. and then at the uh, and the imaging environment, we're typically at about one pascal. So trying to get this camera to work. Well, maybe it won't work, but um, yeah, so 60 pascals in the uh, imaging environment to about one pascal uh, for a high high vacuum mode is the rough uh, vacuum levels. Gotcha. So what would you say about the uh, short maintenance of this model? Like, is it easy to... Uh, yeah, there, there's no, yeah, there's no maintenance. So basically mm -hmm. no maintenance until you need to replace the source, right? Every SDM has a source with a finite lifetime. Mm -hmm. However, uh, the source on this system has a 1500 hour plus lifetime. So generally, uh, this is probably the most common question that comes up actually when we're showing people the phenom is the maintenance and, um, it's plug and play, uh, for 1500 plus hours. And then after 1500 plus hours, a service guy can, can come help you out and replace your source. Um, so if you think about 1500 hours, that's several years probably mm -hmm. before, if you're using it a few hours a day, before you actually need to worry about any maintenance. Uh, whereas like with the tungsten source, those typically will die in 50 to 150 hours. So it's a lot more frequent for the maintenance. Um, so that's one of the, another reason it's well equipped for, remote access is you're never going to have to have a catastrophic failure where the system just blacks out because the source burnout, cerium hexaboride doesn't black out, it'll slowly dull. Um, so yeah, maintenance, you know, maybe every two to three years, depending on how much you're using it or less, um, right. if you don't use it as much. I guess one of the attendees were interested in like getting some tilted images about maybe like a cross-sectional mm -hmm. image. Uh, do you have a, like a Feno model that also supplies those kind of rotational stage. Yeah. 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 We we do. So we have we have two. We have a special. There's two options for tilting things, right? So one option is, as anyone as you may know, Ashgur and anyone else on the call, one way you can get cross sections in SCM is just by using a special stub with a 90 degree cut in it. You can mount your sample mm -hmm. on the cut. Yeah. That's probably the most uh, common thing people do. But if you wanted to take it to the next level and you actually wanted to be able to tilt your sample inside of the SDM, we have a eucentric sample holder that can tilt the sample eucentrically uh, up to 90 degrees. And a eucentric tilt just means when you tilt your sample, it will refine the position and the focal plane for you. So it's actually really easy to use. And, but uh, it's not great. Right. 
And then uh, we've seen that you were using Teamweaver. Uh, so would they also be using the Teamweaver if they had like had an account themselves? Like, what would you say about the remote access imaging? Yeah, uh, Teamviewer is one option. Uh, you know, in addition to Teamviewer, so you know, right now I'm using Teamviewer, but I'll show you here. Um, we use Teamviewer here at Nanoscience, and we can Teamviewer into our uh, customers' instruments. So here I have Teamviewer, and you can see all of the different phenoms throughout Nanoscience. And this one here is the one that's in the the lab that I that I'm working on right now. But you don't have to use Teamviewer, right? You could use so here's the image, and um, you could use TeamViewer, you could use Zoom. Um, there, it, it, TeamViewer is just one option, right? So mm -hmm. I'm moving around now on my laptop. You know, you can see the lag's a lot better now because our Wi-Fi is not uh, broken anymore. But yeah, TeamViewer is just one option. You, you don't have to use TeamViewer. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Oh, thank you very much. So we couldn't answer all of the questions for the interest of time, but uh, we'll try to get back to you with answers over emails, I believe. Yep. Thank you again, Zach. Yep. Yeah, well, thanks, thank everybody. Thank you. Um, well, I want to, uh, again, thank Zach, especially, but also our panelists from the RAIN Network. We really appreciate your participation. Um, and we hope you will take advantage of the RAIN Network at, um, uh, I know that uh, we put into the, Renee put into the chat box, the www.nanoforme. Um, uh, dot org backslash remote access. Please take advantage of that uh, for your bringing it into your classroom or just for your usage. So uh, thank you again. And uh, this officially concludes today's webinar. Thank you.